That's interesting, Catch, because it's almost like, well, what's what works, right? Char- Charlie was – he started hard, Great but then question. became like the player's coach, right? And everyone was like, man, he's, the players love Charlie, right? To, to the point where he was about to get, get let go – and all the players show up on a Monday press conference after Kansas to show their support of him because that's how much he cared about them. And that's how much those players cared about him. And that didn't work. And he, so you bring in, you know, the hard ass, you know, who's sit the F up in, in the meetings and all the other type of stuff. And it worked to a certain degree. Got you, got you, got you far. They were competitive. Like they say what you want to say. They were competitive. They weren't getting blown out. But, you know, after 73 season, they say, okay, that's, that, that, that's not enough. Okay. So you bring in Sarkeesian, who's more of like a, then kind of back to a player's coach, you know, he is kind a of that, player's coach. He is a player's coach. Like Sarkeesian's a teacher, you know, and, and Sarkeesian at the, when he, the problem is when he tried to assert himself last year and when he tried to flex, guys weren't necessarily trying to hear it at that point. They're like, ah, come on, man. Like, you, 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 you're you a cool guy. Like, we, you're cool, but you ain't going to yell at me, you know? It's, you know, it's like you and I are cool. And, and sometimes you, you get t- heated with me. I'm like, come on, catch. Like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> we cool. So that, so then it's like, what's the formula to get through? Is it as simplistic as saying you've got to bring in guys from winning programs and winning cultures from the transfer portal and saying, hey, guys, this is how we've done it. You know, one of the things that Morrow talked about is like leaning on a guy like Keelan Robinson, who was at Alabama when they when they won a national championship and saying, hey, is this what it felt like? What did you guys do? It, it, does, it, does it seem similar? What it needs to be done? Even if Keelan wasn't a key, key contributor, he was still on the team. Even He said leaning on a guy like Ovia Gofu, who was like he was a part of a, a CFP team that lost to Alabama that year. Is this what it feels like? Maybe it's more like that, bringing in dogs who are, who are saying, hey, man, we, we hate losing. And, and bringing in guys who, at the end of the day, you know, when, when the, the, everyone's selling Austin, and it's, oh, you know, Austin's a great city, come to Austin, look at, look at all the places, let's, let's take the kids down to 6th Street, and let's tell you how amazing, great of a time you can have here. Look how awesome it is. And maybe it's just something like, you really haven't accomplished anything yet. You, you, yes, you're here in Austin, and it's great. Yes, you're going to get a fantastic education, but at the end of the day, you still need to accomplish more. Catch, how many guys on this roster are just still a percentage of guys who are here because they just want to get a UT education? They don't even care if they play. I got, I'm here for my diploma. I think we're tech. You talk about the highest couple things. You talk about the highly rated recruits. One of the things that Texas has had a problem with, I think, over the course of the last decade, is that too many of their players have viewed getting the Texas as they made it. Like, they've accomplished the thing that they wanted to accomplish. I'll never forget. I, I, I won't give out the – I don't want to call anybody out, but I can remember when uh, a local kid got hit, like, committed to Texas – and I remember that night, like he and his family, they went out to like the nicest steak food restaurant in town and like celebrated as opposed, and, and I'm not saying that's even wrong, but that guy ended up being a guy that didn't make it into the program that struggled to keep the intensity switch on. So I think there's a player profile that has to be fixed. I do have an opinion on, I think you asked the exact right question. It's the one that was in my head and it was what works, right? Because Texas has bounced around from players coach to asshole coach to players coach again. I think if I, if I can use hindsight here, If we go back to – here was the problem with Tom Herman, who I kind of like. I think there's an alternative universe out there where Tom and I are good friends. This is is so odd, by the way, because you guys were so combative during his tenures. This is fascinating. I know, but I think there's an alternative universe out there where, like, he and I can be direct with each other and it's okay and, like, no hard feelings. I think Tom – the sit the F up moment 
in the program was needed. But what was needed beyond that was for Tom to stick to it. And what happened was Tom, ultimately Tom more than anything else did want to be liked. I mean, he, ha he had the ability to be a hard ass, but he did care what people said about him, what people thought about him, but the image that he projected and that went to his locker room. You know, he tried to be a nicer guy in year two and tried to meet the players in the middle. And I think what really needed to happen was Tom Herman needed to break the program. He needed, when the players pushed back and were like, we're all going to transfer, he didn't have 2022 transfer rules in play to help him. So when the mutiny was about to happen, and if you'll remember in year one, it was about to happen. He needed the mutiny. He needed to get the, the cancer out, cut it all out. And he didn't quite have the, and look, I don't blame him. I couldn't have done it either. This isn't me criticizing Tom Herman and suggesting that what he needed to do was easy. Because if it was me, I'd have probably wanted to be friends and be the nice guy on top of trying to be the hard guy. I'd want, to, I'd want it both ways, and it's hard to do that. What needed to happen was the program needed to be broken. And all these little, I can't say it, but the complainers, oh, he's too hard on us. Oh, this isn't fun. Oh, he's, he's a meanie. That needed to get the hell out. And Herman at that point needed to get guys that could live with being pushed really, really hard. And I don't know if that, and because he didn't quite go the distance, we know that Charlie he, did, But did, did he have the runway to go to distance? No, he didn't. That's what I'm saying. Like That's the hard part. He, he tried to go to distance, and there were so many complaints, and then having to sit down with administrators. And what was needed was somebody to do, ignore that. And I'm yes. not telling you that's easy. No, it's, it's not. But you because the hard part what is, I wrote, and I would have probably said, Herman's got to change it up. Herman's got to do this. Herman's got to do that. And what I'm telling you in hindsight, four or five years later, is to hear Moro Ajomo say what he said makes me think back to Herman's first year and how he wanted to break the program of the things that Ajomo is talking about. And the players pushed back, and Herman didn't break them. And parents pushed back too. And but you know what, parents, the would if you push even administration out, you don't back. have to worry about those parents anymore. And the thing is, I don't know that Herman wins keeps his job long term, right? Like what the program needs and what Herman would have needed probably are two different things. Herman's looking out for himself. But what the program needed was for the cancer to be completely taken out of the body. And it didn't happen. They didn't get it all. He tried. There was pushback. He didn't finish all of the, all of the, the, the work that needed to be done. And now, two years into Steve Sarkeesian's tenure, we're still at this point. We're still talking about the same things that existed in year two under Herman. And when I say I have questions about what happens from here, I don't know that Steve Sarkeesian and this staff are wired in a way to completely tear it down, like a total tear down and replace all of the, the stiffs and complainers and, 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 and acceptors of mediocrity with people that won't, I don't know. Because to hear Moro Ajomo talk about it, it's still an issue. And... Yeah, and Come catch, on. like, one of, the, one of our posters, uh, GT69 uh, on our board, he posted something really, I, I, you know, really good on, the, on our thread, and I actually reached out to him. I thought I really liked what he said because he talked about the need for, like, war daddies, you know, on the team. He talked like, the Vince Young-led teams. But the thing he said at the end of his post 
I, I, it just hit me. He goes, how many times have we heard a coach say that they want players so-and-so to become more vocal? And catch, I feel like I've written that thing every year since I've been here. You've asked, so you personally asked Sark about whether or not the team believed, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, had the buy-in. Does he feel like he had the buy-in? Yes. And he was like, I'm not going to answer that question. I'll let them answer it. You've got to ask them. None of the players <laughs> have well, answered. Well, we did. <laughs> it didn't sound good. Yeah. You know, and I think that's it just points to the, the the deeper challenge when we start talking about, you know, sometimes it's there's a psychology here that it goes into it. And so there may be a good mix. There may be a, a, a mix of, you know, badass, hard ass. You know, he may just need some guys who – you know, that are in forces. You know what they catch? The one thing that is interesting, I, I, you know, as I think about it, the only one of the only successful coach, truly successful coach that I can think of that every player liked that I know of. I mean, some of me know some of some others, but I talk about players love was like Tony Dungy. Like that was like the one guy you've heard, like, you won't have to this day. No one will ever say anything bad about Tony. Anybody who's ever There's played still be some people who say he wasn't tough enough. Yes. On his players. Correct. And that there was an edge that was missing that ultimately. Well, that's why they brought in Gruden. TV. Yeah. For that. But when you think about the truly successful coaches, they only hear about how much they loved. I, 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 how many people go back and say, man, Nick Saban, was the most warm, friendliest, cuddliest guy I've ever been around. Man, Urban Meyer, man, he, he, unless your name is Tim Tebow, Urban Meyer, man, that guy, he was just so nice, so friendly to me. Like, you don't hear that a lot about the truly, truly successful coach. What you usually hear, Catch, a lot of times is that they're assholes. And I think the they do that. For, always are. Yes, yes. Sometimes even the nice ones are assholes, but that's a totally different subject. <laughs> <laughs> but that's usually a different There are a lot of ways. women out there that might watch this video and go, what the hell are those two men talking about? They're all assholes. Yes, very true. All, all the wives said amen. Uh, <laughs> but Very so, loud. Hallelujah, amen from a certain side of the congregation. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, because some, and there, there may be some of that, you know, that may, there, and again, it's Sarkeesian, and he's going to stay true to himself, but there may be a, a so, some of other, of like, listen, guys, I don't give a F. We've done nothing, and this is what we need to do. Go out there and party on 6th Street if you want to. You're going to get your ass get kicked. By Arkansas, by Alabama this year, the same way it happened against Arkansas. Like there may be some needs to be some come to Jesus moments that need to occur. You ever? Um, I know you have. I know mm -hmm. this is going to connect with you because you've lived all over the U.S. Mm -hmm. Ever be it do all of your let's say on the dating scene, mm -hmm. you got your your Mac Daddy vibes, and you've been let's say you've been living in Detroit or Florida. And you've done that for a while and you figured it out and you got your fat, you, you got, you got your game down, right? You know yeah. exactly what your game is. And you go to another place, another mm. area, another piece of the country and you show up and you got your game yeah. and you try it with a new, a different group Don't of work. women. And it's like, Don't work. if you're a Texas guy, you go to like the East coast, you got to adjust Unless you just want to play, I'm the cowboy Texan guy, and that's your thing, and you play that up with a, a lot of howdies and a thick accent. Otherwise, you have to adjust. The thing that I'm worried about with the staff isn't their qual overall quality. My worry is that they've got one pitch. It's a great pitch. They got a Randy Johnson fastball, and they've all – coached at high levels and gotten there to a certain extent with what they do to me it's very possible that this staff showed up last year all the Alabama guys did their Alabama stuff at Texas mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Texas guys just went yeah so I think this staff it happens in dating right 
Yes. You know, like one person, you date someone and it's like, it goes terrifically. Another person figures out the formula and then live happily ever after, right? I think it's a matter of this staff has to, to, to very naturally figure it out. Our Alabama pitch on the field and building a culture didn't work in year one with these guys. Are we going to do the same thing all over again? Or can we make the adjustment knowing that what this group needs ain't what Alabama needed? Nick fixed that on his own 15 years ago. What this Texas program needs is something that I quite frankly don't know who the right person is. If I knew the, if I knew the answer, if we all knew the answer, mm. it'd be so easy. It's, it's much harder than that. It's, it's nitpicking Tom Herman for doing 60% of the thing that was needed and then saying, well, he didn't do that other 40%. Who's a guy that could do that full 60-40? And it's like, well, Urban Meyer could have. Or Nick Saban could have. I don't know. Like, maybe there are only a couple of guys in the country that, I don't know. Like, I, I just don't, I don't know. What I know is it needs to be done. And I just don't know whether this staff has the chops to do it. If they fail, it won't mean that they're not good coaches. It'll just mean that they weren't the right coaches for this job because they'll get jobs again. Kyle Flood's offensive line sucks this year. He's going to get another good job. He's too good of a recruiter. He's got too good of a resume. At some point, they do that thing that happened with Charlie. When Charlie got removed from Tech, even though Charlie did the worst head coaching performance of any head coach in terms of win-loss percentage in the history of the program, when it ended, and a few years went by and everybody realized, like, oh, it wasn't just Charlie. Then people point at the Texas thing that Ojomo is talking about, and they don't blame it on the coaches. And I think that every coach on this staff, to some degree, will get a little bit of benefit of the doubt in their industry because people will look at the Texas gig and go, that's just, just too hard. I mean, Charlie couldn't do it. Herman couldn't do it. Matt Brown eventually at the end couldn't do it. Like, you know, you start getting to enough guys couldn't do it. It's like, well, who can do it? And, you know, people ask me this on Orange Bloods all the time. And it's hard to come up with a definitive answer. And all of the definitive answers that you come up with are nearly impossible to pull off. It's why the Nick Saban pursuit, or excuse me, the Urban Meyer pursuit last year was so important in a way because as horribly as he flamed out in the NFL, we know he's one of the greatest college coaches and his methods is probably what Texas needed. Just break them. And, and, and you know what, if parents complain, fuck them too. That's what urban Meyer would have done. Mm -hmm. But like, I can, I can put my hand out. I don't know that I can use five fingers to count all of the guys that are alive today that could do what Urban Meyer or Nick Saban can do with a football program at the college level. Yeah, it's so funny you say that. I just saw an article over the weekend. Did you see where uh, Grambling, the volleyball coach, got rid of every single one of the players on the team? Cut them all, every single one. Just like, I'm starting fresh, I'm starting over. Everybody, like, there's no one on scholarship right now at the volleyball program because that coach was like, no, I'm just going to do it, uh, you know, in, in a different way. Well, and Sarkeesian is going to have a massive player turnover on the roster by the end of year two, in part because the, the rules have allowed him a little bit more wiggle room to do the, you know, the, the person at Grambling can do that. Chris Beard can do that yeah you can do it in different sports when you have an 85 person roster in college football you need more than a couple of years to be able to do that by the time Sarkeesian fully does it will he have the one loss record on his resume that allows him then to grow 
with a team that no longer has potentially the players that have become kind of the problem players in the program. We, we have no idea to know whether or not the guys that Sarkeesian brings in will have that mentality. Last thing I'll say on this, and we can wrap it up. And I got if one they, more thought on this too, by the way. By, uh, by all means. I needed Xavier Worthy to say what more. And I don't mean, I'm not putting this on Xavier. Xavier is just the most, I wrote about Xavier in my column this weekend and like how much of a leader he's emerged. The, the thing about Moro Ajomo's comments that had me rolling my eyes when I heard them is that Moro is a part of this, whether he knows it or not. He didn't get better last year. He started all 12 games last year. And if I'm not mistaken, he finished with two and a half tackles for loss. Was it? I can't remember a single game last year where I was like, damn, Moro Ajomo did the damn thing. I mean, Moro Ajomo played last year like a guy that needs to be replaced. So, while I am glad he said what he said because he opened the curtain and let us see the wizard of Oz for the wizard that, uh, or the, the leadership that's existed. There've been multiple wizards of Oz, I suppose, but I really want to hear the best players in this program. Bijan needs to be the guy saying that he needs to be calling it out. And he needs to be, we're changing this. And I can feel it changing. From Mauro Ajomo's lips, it felt like a cry for help in a way. Help me, please. A little bowl of porridge for my little orphan self who can't get out of this trouble. Like, help me. It didn't feel like, I'm going to get this shit done if I have to do it myself. And Xavier's got a little bit of that in him. It's the thing that, in a way, gives me the most hope for this team is that you got enough guys like that who start to show up and things can change. But I haven't yet seen, and it'd be completely unfair in a lot of ways to expect Xavier Worthy, not even 12 months on campus, to be the kind of guy that, would do that. But if this thing gets changed before Xavier Worthy leaves campus, he's the type of guy that I want to hear say the things that Mauro Ajomo said, but I want it to happen after some, some change has happened that they can point to and say, we've changed this. And, you know, again, woo woo. That's not where Moro is coming from. And I'm curious to see if Sarkeesian, the next time he meets with the media this week, is asked about the Ajomo comments because it does go hand in hand with what Sarkeesian is working with in terms of he knows, I think, what his challenge is. But, you know, we, the whole, I don't, don't ask me. You know, we just joked about it. Ask the team. Well, they asked the team. The team, the team told us. You know, mm-hmm. there's a little bit of like, I'm curious what his thoughts are on when one of your players says that and seems to scream that there's a bigger challenge that this coaching staff has to take on beyond getting an edge rusher or freshman offensive lineman who are five stars or maybe a transfer portal linebacker. When there's this bigger thing. It's a cloud that hovers around the program and won't go away until it's completely addressed, which is why you've been here eight years. It's going to be season nine, Anwar. Same goddamn thing from the very season you arrived till right now. Same, same issues. And that's amazing to me that try as they might, the riddle can't apparently be solved. The thing is, it's funny when you, you when you say Xavier. The thing that comes to my mind is is a dog. You know, like you if you got a, if you've got your house and you got a fence around it, and you say who's going to protect the house, you put Xavier out there because you know someone steps over that fence that it's it's a wrap. It's going to be nothing but slow slinging and flower bringing. Okay, and you when you think of Xavier, catch you think losing bothers him, don't you? No doubt about it. You can tell it bothers him. 
don't know if it bothers everybody the way that it bothers a guy like that, a true competitor, a guy that they need more dogs like that. You know, think about who he signed with. Yeah, he signed with Jim Harbaugh, who's not cuddly at all, mm -hmm. who's a total hard ass, who has a program of toughness. Not the most wide receiver friendly offense in the world, but something about Xavier connected with Michigan of all the programs in America. Cause you gotta, cause Michigan's a little dog, a little doggy, especially under Harbaugh. Nothing pretty, but you know you're gonna be in a fist fight. Mm -hmm. And it's been a long time. Has there ever been a Texas team since you've been here that at the end of the year? Every team on the schedule was like, say what you want to about Texas, but you don't want to fight them in a dark alley. Not only that, catch, I, I no, and I can't say since I've been here, I've seen Texas teams that were really pissed off after losses. Like, I, I don't see the, the helmet throwing. I don't see, you know, and it's something that's, you know, you, you got to control your emotions. But when we're talking about like football coming out of the heat of battle, gladiator stuff. I don't see the Gatorade stuff being turned over. I don't see guys cursing in the locker room. I don't see the guys. I don't see guys hate losing. And I think that's probably got to be frustrating. Well, they got a coaching staff. And again, hey, I mean, you know, Jeff Banks is making a million dollars a year. He got made headlines for having a party after, an, you know, partying after the Iowa State loss. And Baylor. After, Baylor. It was, was Baylor. it Baylor? Okay. After the Baylor loss. And then – Monkey games, you know what I mean? Like this program needs leadership that hates losing. And I don't, I, I, I bet there are coaches last year on that staff that hated Oscar, not Oscar Giles, Bo Davis. Yeah. Bo Davis hated losing. Correct. Did they all hate losing though? Or were they having a little too good a time of living in Austin, Texas? And, you know, great city in the world and all of the things that a person can do when they're not trying to be great at football. You know, I think that again, everybody coaches included, there's a, there's a, there's an adjustment that has to be made inside the culture. And it just to tie it all up to where we were in the very beginning. It's the biggest reason why I'm still not quite ready to, I know what you're saying about Oshawn Mathis. Cause on paper, they should have enough talent to compete for a big 12 championship. Probably without Oshawn Mathis. I mean, they should. I just, I need, I am fully at a point now where until I see this program really change, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. And so everybody in YouTube land, forgive me. The last dozen seasons of football have stolen my will to give free belief. It's gone. And now I'm a cranky, jaded asshole that the women in the congregation are amen, amen and about. And I need to see it. And last season, I didn't see it. So for all of the, are they getting better on the field and are the players improving? And there's just a bigger thing that has to happen. And until it happens, it's hard to believe, oh, it's just going to happen because we say so. Yeah. But they, there's the last thing I'll say, you know, I'll try to wrap it up. Um, need more dogs, need more guys who want to make it to the NFL. You know, you go to, you go to Alabama, the thought process is I'm here to get to the NFL. I'm going to do whatever it takes. It's not like, here, I'm great. I'm out of Alabama. Yay. No, they need guys who, you know, have their aspirations. Like, everybody that goes to Alabama, all due respect to the University of Alabama. I don't know how many people are going there because of the diploma, right? But I think most people are going there because, you know, if you're, if you're a football player, you're going there because you want to go to the NFL. That's just it. You're going to Georgia, for the most part, as a football player because you want to go to the NFL. You come to Texas – Man, you, 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 hey, I got I got my degree. I've I, you know I've got not a good years. Like you need people who have aspirations to do great, to do better. I think one of the things that Morrow talked about. He goes, these guys are more willing to party than they are to try to you know put in the work in order to make you know fifty million down the line. So you know they need you know need the guys like that. But I tell you this, 
if in this, this we'll, well, I'll end on this. If Quinn Ewers is that guy, and if Quinn Ewers is the dog, and Quinn Ewers is the guy that we say, okay, he, he's about that action, then you might, you would probably see things starting to turn. To your point, seeing is believing. This is the offseason. You can talk yourself into anything. But if, if Quinn develops into that alpha that this program needs and he becomes the guy that they rally around, it becomes a difference maker when you start talking about switching and changing the culture. But you need somebody that everyone looks up to that that person says, we need to do this. Whether it's like Vince, and maybe Vince was like that to a certain degree, that alpha who came in and basically helps to change the trajectory of the program. I'm not saying it has to be Vince. But if he could be Colt, you know, well, I guess Colt kind of carries over from Vince to a certain degree. But if you could be something to that effect where people listen, believe, and say, yes, man, take us to the promised land. If Quinn's that guy, then all of a sudden the, the videos that we're having are going to be much different. I feel like this conversation needed to happen. I mean, I did. It's why the Ojomo comments from last week, as soon as they came out, I was like, oh, got to do a video. And like, it came out today, a couple of days later. Um, there's a lot in there that's uncomfortable in the conversation that we just had. It's all really important. Like it's, it's the, the guts of what needs to change in order for this program to take the next step. And, you know, I think the elephant in the room needed to be addressed and I'm glad we did so. Leave your comments in the comments section. A lot of comments. Are we too hard? Are we too, are we, again, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to accept that I am jaded. They're going to say, is catch too hard? And I, I don't mean, know if I was too hard. But am I unfair? <laughs> I don't feel unfair. I mean, you know, I'm, I, I'm reacting to what has happened and not what hasn't happened. And what's happened is five and seven happened last year. And this is the third coach in nine seasons or fourth and nine. I, I lo I've lost count. So look, leave your comments in the comments section. I'm not even going to completely ask you to like subscribe to the channel today. I know uncomfortable conversations Describe whatever it. but i will say rogueshop.com just do this go to rogueshop.com today just check it out trust I, I feel confident enough that if you go to the website you don't need us to even sell you on anything at that point you're just gonna go hmm gummies <laughs> <laughs> And then like the rest will take care of itself and your life will change for the better like it has for Anwar and myself. And that's not even hyperbole. Literally, Anwar's life has changed. Changed. I'm actually Literally. in a healthy relationship now. That It has changed. <laughs> Anwar's whole look, outlook on life has changed a little bit because of the rogueshop.com. What, what more of a personal endorsement could anybody possibly give? Until tomorrow. Hey, really, thanks fully and truly for watching today's video and always hanging out with Anwar and I and the entire Orange Bloods team of videos that we do. Shout out to Michael Rockman for always doing a great job of producing the videos and getting them out. And uh, we'll talk to you later. You guys take care of each other.